for statements, and I recognize the member from Willowdale. Thank you very much. Good morning to you, Speaker. It's my privilege uh, to rise in the House today to recognize the work, passion, and vision of a great community leader, a great friend who grew up in North York, John Gadatsis. Johnny G, as his friends call him, is a passionate textile artist who works hi and highlights and pays homage to Ontario's history. As part of the Canadian Tapestry and Texture Centre, Johnny G collaborates every day with Canadian artists and art professionals who share his vision of bringing Canadian stories to the forefront at home and around the world. Through their work with tapestry, Johnny G and his colleagues create lasting memorials that connect community members from across Canada with each other and to our shared history. They remind us all the importance of helping to tell Canada's magnificent story. Through exhibitions and workshops, the Canadian Tapestry and Texture Centre inspires Canadians of all ages and works to attract international textile artists to help them develop their skills needed to create beautiful tapestry. These works of arts, Mr. Speaker, can take over 450 hours to complete. Here in Ontario, we're lucky to have talented and skilled individuals like Johnny G. And so this morning, Speaker, I want to congratulate Johnny G on his continued success and thank him for supporting Ontario's arts community. Sorry I missed the uh, reveal of your latest piece. I'll be sure to be there next time. Gigi must be very proud of you. you the man, Johnny. Thank you. Once again, I'm going to remind members that we are currently in member statements, and I realize people are coming and going and people are catching up with each other. Please keep the private conversations as low as possible so as to allow the member to make their statement so that I can hear the member. Member statements. The next member is Toronto St. Paul's. Speaker, one of Canada's last standing independent children's bookstores, Mabel's Fables, an iconic landmark within our Mount Pleasant village, is under attack by this government and the previous government's Eglinton Crosstown construction delays and by a new predatory landlord who increased rent by 70 per cent. Mabel's Fables owner Eleanor Lafave is a woman entrepreneur and the keeper of 32 years of beloved memories created in her small business, which doubles as a community second home. Home for everyone who has visited. Indie bookstores are the vibrant cultural DNA of our communities. They are a lifeline for local authors. Eleanor and other small businesses fighting for their right to exist are exhausted. Their family savings, physical and mental health depleted. In Eleanor's words, $3 million spent on marketing is misguided. This is too late. Reform the Punishing Municipal Property Assessment Corporation. Help us with a refund on property taxes. What about rent? control for small businesses, provide us with mental health workers. Eleanor is terrified of the looming retail apocalypse if this government doesn't stand up for small businesses, and I couldn't agree more. Conservatives, $3 million is a Band-Aid solution. It is a day late and a dollar short. In the meantime, though, Speaker, we are all going to continue to shop on Eglinton, and we're going to bring our friends from across Ontario to shop, drink, eat, do it all until we drop. Thank you very much. The next statement, the member for Mississauga East, Mississauga East Cooksville. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and good morning. Uh, this morning, Mr. Speaker, I would like to acknowledge and share an announcement that was held in my great riding of Mississauga East Cooksville. On March 5th, a new child care center caring for kids opened up to serve our local community in providing high-quality licensed child care services. Cooksville parents have spoken loud and clear that they want to see greater choice and affordability in our child care system. Mr. Speaker, this grand opening event was an opportunity for us to celebrate the collaborative effort and partnerships that has resulted in the opening of this wonderful center that will offer quality licensed child care for our families. I would like to thank Caring for Kids and the region of Peel for your dedication to opening this new center in our community and working alongside our government to make this a reality. Our government is committed to investing in quality childcare and early learning for families. Caring for kids is a start and will lead by example to other areas 
in the city of Mississauga to the vital importance in having high quality licensed child care services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you very much. The member for Kingston and the Islands. It's been a while since I've had to sit through the name promise made seal talk from the other side. It's been nice, and there's a reason we haven't had to hear that orchestrated self indulgent back padding because, well, they're having a hard time keeping any promise. Let's review. They set class sizes at 28, then 25, now 23. They introduced mandatory e-learning, now there's an opt-out. They canceled the Francophone University, now it's being built. They destroyed supports for autistic children, currently bungling the repair job. They vowed to cut children's aid funding by 28 million, but with pressure, they still have kept the old funding model. They plan to stop the transition child benefit for low-income families, but thankfully were forced to keep it. They've cut funding to public health, then they reversed it, although it's worth noting, Speaker, that despite COVID-19, they have yet to make that perma uh, reversal permanent. The Act's promise funding for rape crisis centres, faced with outrage, partially revoked that cut, made invisible license plates, denied it for months, and now we have the old ones. They tried to open the green belt for development twice, and you can guess what I'm going to say here, backtracked on that too. They brought back patronage appointments that had not been used in decades so the Premier's previous Chief of Staff could hand out jobs to his pals, and then they were forced to fire them. Speaker, with one failed project after another, how can Ontarians possibly trust this government to lead in a time? of actual crisis between the unaddressed housing crisis the coronavirus pandemic and the climate emergency how can we have faith in a government that has bungled every single one of its decisions next we have the member for northumberland peterborough south thank you mr speaker i'm pleased to speak today to a truly remarkable organization in my riding cornerstone Family Violence Prevention Centre. Cornerstone received funding last year from the Government of Ontario to build an addition to help expand service delivery and supports for victims of family violence. I'm excited to be attending the ribbon cutting on Friday to celebrate the opening of the space, which will be utilized as a counselling space to deliver one-on-one -on -one supports, including counselling, family court supports and housing support services. The space is a softer, more comforting place to experience these services and will help to increase Cornerstone's capacity, enabling 30 per cent more people to receive support if needed. The space is a welcomed addition to the programs Cornerstone offers women and children in Northumberland County. I would like to thank the truly remarkable staff and board at Cornerstone Family Violence Prevention Centre for their continued work and commitment to ending violence against women. I would also like to acknowledge Cornerstone's International Women's Day lunch last week, which unfortunately I was unable to attend this year, which was a great success in our community, and thank everyone who attended. In closing, Mr. Speaker, we know that far too often gender-based violence targets women Indigenous women, racialized women, new Canadians, and women in rural and northern communities like mine. Together, we must do better, Mr. Speaker, to end violence against women. Thank you. Thank you. Order. Member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, will come to order. Whoever over on the opposition side is yelling back, I don't know who it is, come to order. We're in member statements. Order. Okay. Stop it. Member statements. The member for Scarborough Guildwood. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I rise today in support of our local community legal clinics and to implore this government to stop the cuts to Legal Aid Ontario. I've received dozens of letters from my constituents who have access who access services at the Scarborough Community Legal Services, our local community legal clinic. And these letters are from the most vulnerable members of my community, from refugees, from new Canadians, ODSP recipients, and low-income rental tenants. The average household income in my riding is below, well below the city and the provincial average. The message from my constituents is clear. They would not be able to afford essential legal assistance had they not been able to receive the services provided by their local community legal aid clinic. Earlier this week, the Neither 
Smarter Nor Stronger report highlighted concerns with the government's proposal to cut services to Legal Aid Ontario, including the removal of language referring as well as um, ref referrals to low-income clients. Legal aid should, not, should focus on the needs of those who need to access justice. Speaker, we should not be cutting services to legal aid. We should not be putting this burden on the most vulnerable people in our communities. The government needs to look at the bigger picture and ensure fair and equal access to justice and legal services in our community and stop these ridiculous cuts. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you very much. The next statement, the member for Toronto Centre. I want to talk about one of my constituents who is here with us today. Cullen Elijah McGrail is a playwright who lives in University Rosedale. He just celebrated his 25th birthday. Cullen has type 1 diabetes. Before his birthday, the OHIP Plus program covered the cost of his insulin and glucose monitoring tests that Cullen needs to manage his diabetes. But now he's 25, he no longer has any coverage. These costs now cost Cullen over $300 a month, and that's a lot of money. Leading up to his birthday, Cullen reached out to my office with a series of letters. He sent me one every single day. He talked about his life, his goals, and his plan to write a play about the discovery of insulin. I learned a lot while reading these letters. In one, Cullen wrote about the scientists who discovered insulin. He said, the Hippocratic Oath was clear that it would be wrong to make money off something that would help humankind. I agree. Cullen should not have to pay out of pocket and risk financial uncertainty for the one thing that keeps him alive. We need a universal pharmacare program, a program where insulin and medications would be available to everyone regardless of their ability to pay. I have made copies of Cullen's letters and will be giving them to the Minister of Health. I look forward to following up with the Minister on this important issue. Thank you for coming today, Cullen. And I say thank you to the member for University Rosedale. I apologize for getting your writing name wrong. <laughs> member statements. The member for Mississauga Lakeshore. Thank you, Speaker. A week ago, I hosted the first ever blind hockey night at the Port Credit Arena in Mississauga Lakeshore. It was great to see so many families attend this special event. Together, we raised over $6,000 for the Canadian National Blind Hockey Team and for the Mississauga Hockey League Play More program, which helps supporting hockey families that need financial assistance. Speaker, I want to take this opportunity to thank a few volunteers, Christina Scanny and Mark DeMontis. This evening, would never have happened without the you. And thank you to the Minister of Seniors and Accessibilities for joining us, all, along with my colleague from the Treasury Board, Aurora Oak Ridges, Richmond Hill. And thank you to Nicholas Canadi and the Mississauga Steelheads, who joined us and donated 500 tickets, one for everyone who attended this event. And thank you to the Peel Police for joining us and to Par Para Sport TV for broadcasting this event. And thank you to the former Toronto Maple Leaf, Brad Boyce, for joining us and playing with both Team Rudy and the National Blind Team. After a trade during the first intermission, the blind team won 5-4, to four, but we all win. Every time we demonstrate, the sports are for everyone, and that's what we did Wednesday night. And thank you to everyone that attended this event. Next statement, the member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker. Brampton is the ninth largest city in Canada. We are one of the fastest growing cities and we are facing a health care emergency. The situation is so bad that in our hospital, thousands of people are treated in the hallways in a hospital that's already overcrowded and underfunded. For 15 years, the Liberal government made a decision. They decided to not invest in our city's health care. And since getting elected, the Conservative government has taken the situation from bad to worse. The situation is so dire that the City of Brampton has declared a health care crisis. The Conservatives can't ignore this issue any longer. People's lives are at risk. Now, with the threat of COVID-19 spreading across the world, including cases here in the GTA, the Region of Peel and the City of Brampton, people are really worried. They are worried about how our health care system that is already suffering from the cuts made by this Conservative government going to handle the possibility of this virus spreading here in Ontario. 
and frankly, they shouldn't have to worry because the people of Ontario have a fundamental right to public health care that is adequately funded. Mm -hmm. Cuts to health care hurt us all, especially at times like this. That's why we in the NDP will be fighting these cuts and working to make sure that the people of Ontario have access to the health care that they need and deserve. Thank you, Speaker. Member for Hastings, Lennox and Addington. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Colleagues, in the global challenges of preventing, treating, and working with COVID-19, we've heard many stories of angst, of heartbreak, of frustration, and of fear. Today, in contrast, I'd like to commend the men and women of CFB Trenton and the people of an entire community and region for their collective response when confronted with receiving repatriated citizens from across Canada. I refer specifically to just under 200 Canadians repatriated from Wuhan, China, and now just over 200 more from the Diamond Princess. Upon their arrival at CFB Trenton, the Air Transport Capital of Canada, they are processed and quarantined by a broad spectrum of healthcare professionals, military personnel, and community volunteers. Not only are they cared for using strict medical protocols, but many members of the community then have stepped forward in with books, with treats, with videos and gifts and more during the entire quarantine period they spend there. This outpouring of generosity and concern, in my mind, truly reflects the caring nature of the Bay of Quinty communities surrounding the Trenton Air Base. So to all involved, I say thank you for making the best of a difficult situation in the most Canadian way. Thank you very much. That concludes our member statements for this morning.